there so other people may be coming in, but we felt like we want to really respect your time. So uh, I'm going to invite Renee Gray, my companion from Area 4 for, I don't know, what, 30 years, um, to be part of our welcome. And then and we've got a wonderful little video to show you from our own Community Arts Center in Area 4. Renee. Good afternoon. So thank you all for coming out on this lovely day. One of the first spring, summer days we've had in a long time. So um, I understand the sacrifice <laughs> that it took to uh, come here instead of uh, somewhere else. But I first want to just give you greetings from the Area 4 Coalition and thank you all for making this event happen. The CRA people and the other neighborhood associations that brought this together. I just enjoyed seeing the notes and the activities and the excitement as it has grown um, over the weeks around this. And so um, we probably are going to be like a milestone by the end of the day. One, for all, all the neighborhoods being here. And for two, what agendas we want to put forward in um, the city and what issues we want to explore and prioritize and, and those kinds of things. Um, but I was talking to Jonathan last week, and one of the things that at this phase of my life I want to remember, and that is um, the term time, treasure, and talent. Uh, basically, that concept was from a philanthropic point of view, but it wanted to be an inclusive um, arena for whether you were a pledgee, you pledge $10 a month, or you could write a check for $10,000 a month. Um, but a way to have everybody feel like there's a part that they can own in that. And today just feels like a day where everyone is bringing their best selves to the table to make this event happen and to come out with products or um, agendas that we can begin to work with. And the time, treasure, and talent is all of you bringing what you have in your brains, your artistic talents, your um, thinking, your creativity, all of that. And we're hoping that we call upon all of that today and that you can bring that forth to make this really a milestone event. And again, thank you. So we have a packed agenda, as you've seen, because there is so much going on in Cambridge. The goals of today are to familiarize ourselves with each other and each other's neighborhoods or each other's issue areas. We know we haven't covered them all today. This is a sampling. We're going to come back together in the fall to do some more, focusing on the environment, focusing on a couple of other neighborhoods, traffic and transit. So this is just really the beginning. It's, but we want people to meet each other, which is why you're at circle tables. Um, not necessarily with the people with whom you came, and there'll be a little explanation of that later. Um, a couple of practical things. There is a bright kind of orange um, registration card at each table. Phyllis is holding it up. Please fill it out and throw it into the box or into the middle of your table so that uh, we can collect them afterwards. There's a, a goldenrod pole. You may want to fill that pole out. That's uh, this. We'd like to get it back. It's anonymous. You may want to fill it out now if you know what you think, or you may want to wait to hear some of the presentations so that you can, um, you, may, you may change your mind about your thinking. So, uh, and we'd like you to just throw that into the middle of the table. Um, there are refreshments in, in the dining room over here. Feel free to get up and, and get some refreshments. We'll have a, we'll have a break for sure. Um, I want to welcome three members of our city council. We're really grateful for their time. Councilor Dennis Carlone. Where's Dennis? Nadine Mazin and Councillor Craig Kelly. So now, I, I, um, Aaron, would you want to come up and say anything about your film before we show it, or, or do would you want one of your young people? Whichever. Great. Um, the Community Arts Center is one of our treasures. 
Uh, hi, I'm Erin Johnson. I'm the Executive Director of the Community Arts Center. Um, we've been uh, doing art space programming with young people in Area 4 for over 80 years. So if you don't know us, you should come visit at 119 Windsor Street. Um, I'm here with one of our youth, Rafael Salas. Um, we created this film in collaboration with the Margaret Fuller Neighborhood House and Tutoring Plus. Um, and the text from the film is a, a, co a combination of uh, young people from all of all three of our organizations, most of whom live in Area 4, uh, answering questions about what they, they feel about themselves, their neighborhood, their future, and the future of their neighborhood. Um, and our, our youth and our team media program took those answers and put them together into basically a poem and created uh, a video poem using footage of uh, the neighborhood and those young people. Um, so you really get a sense of of who we are or who our young people are um, and, and, and what they're thinking about their, their neighborhood. So um, this is really not just speaking for the Art Center, but really a large number of young people in, in our neighborhood. I am here. I am going to college. I am going to help people who need help. I am going to work in criminal justice. I am going to be successful and have my own career. I am going to work in a company here. I am going to be a doctor. A fashion designer. A scientist. And an artist. I'm still figuring things out. I am here. My neighborhood keeps getting taller. Soon, it will be full of new buildings. Soon, it will be nothing like it is now. Soon, it will be filled with smart people. Soon, it may not have me in it. I am here. I hope that in the future my family will be safe. I hope that there will be no more violence. I hope that I will still live here. I hope we all can communicate. I hope that we all come together. I am here. afternoon. Um, so I'd like to bring up our um, Harvard Square panel that's part of our first section which is where have we been or what are we doing right now. So um, our Harvard Square panel will be chaired by Ken Taylor who will introduce his partner. So Harvard Square team, come up. Good afternoon. I'm impressed that we're all here this afternoon on such a wonderful day. Um, I'm Ken Taylor. I'm an architect, an urban planner, a Cambridge resident. My office is at 2 Craigie Street, and I live at 23 Berkeley Street. In the past six months, an ad hoc group has come together to focus on preventing inappropriate development on Winthrop Square and enhancing historic and underappreciated Winthrop Park. Winthrop Park is the location of Pete's, Staples, Grendel's Den. Um, I think you can probably identify the location right in Harvard Square. The group includes, and would you please stand when your name is called, Jane Thompson. I'm not sure. Is Jane here? James Williamson. Marilee Myers. Marilee, Jonathan King, right here, Carrie Kuzler, Carrie's here, Pebble Gifford, and Carol Perot is right here. The owner of 57 JFK Street in Harvard Square last December submitted an application 
to the Cambridge Historical Commission for a certificate of appropriateness for a project proposing maximum build out of his site on the southwest side of historic Winthrop Park. The site currently accommodates Staples, Shake Shack, and other retail ten tenants, as well as 96 Winthrop Street, which is the 1845 Hyde Taylor House currently occupied by the Hasty Pudding Club. The developer's proposal was to add three floors of micro apartments, 40 minutes, 40 uh, units, 4 to 500 square feet to the maximum zoning limits of building, plan, and height. He stated that the only special permit required from the planning board was the waiver of the parking requirement. Our story today is about the project review and approval process. Uh, the members of the ad hoc panel will be available to answer questions during Q&A. The pivotal Cambridge Historic Commission meeting was their most recent public meeting on the project in April 3rd, the developer had submitted four iterations to the commission. Members of the ad hoc group made focused arguments during the public comments period. Kitty Dukakis, who was the director of public space partnerships in 1986, oversaw the Winthrop Park improvements, spoke of the public and historic importance of the park. Carol Perot is going to give she organized and gave a comprehensive PowerPoint presentation. Before we do that, timekeeper is, we have 10 minutes, right? Yes. Okay, I'm doing two, Carol's doing six, yes. and then I'll do two of the. Okay, I didn't know she was doing the six. Okay. okay. We need Carol. the lights, yes. The lights, please. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to have my back to you because of the technology here. Um, as Ken said, I presented this at the uh, hearing. The PowerPoint is six mic, minutes. Just use the, use mic. the mic, please. Yes. The PowerPoint. It's not on, Carol. The PowerPoint. Yikes. The PowerPoint is six minutes long, and Pebble Gifford actually ceded three minutes to me. So here goes. Harvard Square Conservation District at a crossroads. Case. Turn that one off. Switch the mics. They're all set differently. And usually. Okay, here we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Case 3181 to construct a three-story residential addition over an existing two-story commercial building. The rally around this case is not about saving the gallery or building as a significant work of architecture or about an aversion to a contemporary building on this spot. It is about achieving a design, amassing a program and materials that are compatible with the Galleria's highly significant functional and visual setting, a setting which take, dates back to the 1630s. A good place to begin is with the footprint. Here we have the footprint of the Galleria in relationship to Winthrop Park and the garage building. The Galleria's substantial footprint was not conceived for a building of five stories. Although a large footprint, it conveys a reduced presence due to its limited height. The proposed massing would overwhelm the park and surrounding context. A program of 40 micro units is driving the project. The proposed design of materials will reduce transparency and access at the street level. Cues for height were taken from the abutting garage tower rather than from Winthrop Park, Winthrop Street, and the larger district context. Here, shown here, is the current and proposed building scale on Winthrop Street. Context. The Galleria site and Winthrop Park are inextricably tied by location. Note the JFK Street and its crossroads, Winthrop Street and Mount Auburn Street. 
The gallery sits prominently on Winthrop Park, the oldest continually used public space in Harvard Square, and one of the oldest in the United States. On JFK Street, the gateway to Harvard Square from Memorial Drive and points beyond. At the crossroads of Mount Auburn and JFK Streets, major thoroughfares in Harvard Square, and on Winthrop Street, a street that survives from the 1630s. Setting includes buildings that span several centuries. Some visual context components to consider is, is scale, sight lines, distinctive buildings that add stature, historical, architectural merit to the district, contemporary non-distinctive buildings that provide background via compatible massing, scale, and materials, topography, park features, and streetscape, and historic structures. Workmanship runs high throughout the district and is a character-defining feature both in historic and contemporary architecture. Winthrop Park's association to our local, state, and national past is vitally important to protect, as are these locally landmark buildings on Winthrop Street that sit next to the Galleria. And this highly significant 17th century retaining wall that is adjacent to the Red House, at risk, Streetscapes that evoke feelings of continuity and connection to the past and to the future. Stunning cupolas and towers that rise above all. Pedestrian friendly components that give vitality to place. At risk, sky views and sun. Sunlight on Winthrop Park would be reduced. Reduced sunlight would potentially harm trees and lawn. Loss of sky equates to loss of open space on the park. Loss of sky views on JFK Street with the sight light reduction of tree canopies. Loss of late afternoon light to businesses, residents, and pedestrians. At risk current interface of public space with private space, loss of public benefit to private benefit, with residential units fitted with large windows and balcony on a small, intimate public park. The developer's other building is the one at the upper corner on Mass Ave. Increase in artificial light levels at night. Investment at risk results of a long, thoughtful, complex planning process that protected these historic structures and made them vital assets to the park and community, along with the restoration of Winthrop Park, based on a 19th century design of cross paths led by a public-private initiative in the 1980s with Kitty Dukakis as the director. She, as Ken said, attended our last hearing. And finally, these expressions of appreciation of the site's history that were introduced by the city. The beware of the tipping point where the integrity of the district becomes so badly eroded by out of scale, scale development that familiar haunts are no longer familiar, lacking in the soul of place and human connection. Reasons that application 3181 should be not denied. At the actual hearing, I read through these uh, reasons, and they are tied to the actual, um, the, the, the language of the district order, as well as um, they summarized what I presented in the PowerPoint. So, Canton is now going to talk about the decision and beyond. As you can see, I think the visual uh, aspect of this had an impact on the commission. 
Um, at the February and March project reviews, the Historic Commission voted to continue the application to allow the developer to address commission concerns. On April 3rd, having reviewed four iterations of the project, the Cambridge Historical Commission voted unanimously to deny a certificate of appropriateness to the project. The developer intends to come back with a new application. On May 1, at the request of the developer, the commission held an informational meeting with no public, with no public comments to review a proposed design. The developer presented a reduced two-story addition with 16 to 20 one and two bedroom apartments. The commission's feedback on the new design was not positive. During the four-month review process, the focus of the historical commission and the staff changed from assisting the developer in designing the project to evaluating and determining its appropriateness. When the commission examined the criteria closely, it rejected the developer's application. Our ad hoc group helped shift the commission's attention leading to the denial. Now we're ready for questions and answers. Uh, there are a number of topics we could discuss. We haven't had an opportunity to look at in detail. We have uh, two minutes, so this is just a very quickie questions or, and you also will have in the boxes cards for you to write questions or comments on and leave them in those boxes and we will make sure that they get addressed in future events. So questions, comments, anything to ask Harvard Square? Aaron? Yeah, um, you said that the, the proposed uh, apartments were potentially going to be within the zoning and so what power does the city have to, to prevent the, the structure and, and what is the discussed here? Um, what are, they, what are they looking for beyond the current zone? The one, the developer took the position that the only special permit that was required from the planning board was a waiver of the parking requirements. Otherwise, they felt they met the height and the uh, FAR requirements. Yeah. Pebble. Anything in the harvest where Excuse me, any changes to buildings in the Harvard Square Historic District have to go to the Cambridge Historical Commission, which is the only reason we were there, because this building is in the district, the gallery. It doesn't look historic. It isn't historic. Oops. But it was going to be changed. So that gave us a handle to go to the commission and say, this change is inappropriate. And then if the building and the developer had gotten the permit from the historical commission, he then would have gone to the planning board and gotten his waiver from parking. So this was a stop the gap measure that we exercised our rights to use. And it can happen in any of the historic districts in this area. Thanks, Pat. Um, I think that's it. Look at the figure. Yeah, that's. I think that's all the time that we have yeah, for this yeah, presentation. Um, we. Uh, I think you'll you'll hear a theme or two today that's really important to you and to us, and that's about what are the agencies in the city that are supposed to be uh, what are hearing um, these proposals and what is the atmosphere like and what are the criteria they're, that they're using. So pay some attention to that because we're hoping we'll have more of us familiar with how the city works, how planning is structured. So um, next up is our Fresh Pond and Alewife panel with Jan Devereaux. Hi everyone, good afternoon. I'm, I'm Jan Devereaux and I have with me uh, Peggy Barnes Leonard, Leonard and Jay Yesselman. We are members of the Fresh Pond Residents Alliance. Um, so that's a beautiful picture of Fresh Pond. <laughs> um, so, what I wanted to quickly do was to show you uh, the Concord Alewife study geometry. Um, this is the planning area, and the geometry refers to the parts that are labeled the triangle, which is 
technically in North Cambridge, uh, Area 11, the Quadrangle, which is in Area 12 along with Cambridge Highlands, and New Street, which has been a point of contention, which is just outside the planning area, but falls in neighborhood nine as defined, which is around Danahy Park, but also extends up to Avon Hill. Um, this area has been called Cambridge's final frontier, and now that Kendall Square has been mostly built out, the quad and the triangle represent the greatest remaining development potential in the city. And since Kendall's redevelopment has included so little housing so far, and Alewife is on the red line, the area looks like a logical place for transit-oriented design. However, there's some big challenges and some missing pieces, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So this is just to recap that uh, the area that we're talking to is here, and it is a bit, as I'll show you, a no man's land um, in terms of falling, uh, encompassing several different areas as defined by the city. Um, but we are all connected by the parkway, our love-hate uh, relationship with the parkway, which runs through the neighborhood that a number of the Fresh Pond uh, Residence Alliance members live in, which is traditionally West Cambridge or Huron Village or the area around Danahy and Concord, Concord Avenue, that is. Um. So here are some scenes from the No Man's Land. I believe this is Mooney Street. Um, at the time of the Concord Alewife study, which was done between 2003 and 2005, the only residents on the study committee were from the Cambridge Highlands neighborhood, which is the enclave all the way out um, Concord Avenue toward Belmont. There were about 700 residents at the time. Um, and since the areas that were in the planning study are located from uh, far from the, the designated neighborhoods to core populations, We've all kind of been asleep. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of um, attention paid, uh, but we are now waking up and realizing that what happens in those bordering neighborhoods directly impacts our lives. Um, and we got started really just at the beginning of this year over a couple of projects closer to home, the Tokyo Restaurant and New Street, but have uh, begun to realize that it's a much larger problem than just what's happening in our own neighborhood. Another. Another scene of the no man's land. You can see off in the distance, the newer building is actually one of the buildings being constructed on Cambridge Park Drive, which is closer to the T. Um, you know, it's, it's clear that this, what happens in this area is going to have an enormous impact on us all citywide because of the sheer size of the underdeveloped area, um, its transit geography and its proximity to Fresh Pond, Danahy Park, and the Elwife Reservation, which are uh, three of the city's most valuable open space resources. another scene. This is looking uh, from the end of Fawcett Street across the commuter rail tracks, again to the back of Cambridge Park Drive where a building is nearing completion. Um, rezoning in 2006, which was at the time of the planning study, gave incentives for the conversion of formerly industrial properties into high density housing uh, and the real estate investment trusts are seeing a gold mine in building what we've called spaceships which are large luxury rental buildings with amenities for their residents, like pools you know, on the roof or in a courtyard, um, but really nothing that enlivens the surrounding area, which desperately needs improvements to both the infrastructure and for pedestrians and bicycles and a, a real sense of place. Um, so this profusion of small units at rents that rents that are high, at the high end for Cambridge but are lower than comparable buildings in Boston. Um, that's what we're calling the spaceships. This is a, uh, looking across, standing on the Route 16 bridge, you can see um, the LYT is there. This is the sort of pioneering uh, cornerstone building, which was actually built as long ago as 2002. It's about 312 apartment buildings, uh, apartments, sorry. Um, but in this area, another even larger building is uh, about to come before the planning board. It will be, it will have a nine-story garage and 378 units. This is uh, the first of the recent wave of what we call spaceships, which was constructed in 2010. It's on New Street across from the entrance to Danahue Park. And uh, this is a side view of it, not its most attractive angle. Uh, the parking lot in the foreground is the parking lot for the J&C Adams Window Company, which is now closed and is uh, scheduled. The same developer is viewing that site as phase two of their development, which would bring another 93 units uh, right next door. And 
and the same developer um, is currently building uh, right um, on Trader on the Trader Joe's rotary. This is a this is the, actually the area's only truly mixed use project. It will have 61 uh, rental apartments and then um, some retail at the base, but it is right on the rotary and it's a, a quite a problematic intersection. And next door, where the Bank of America uh, building is going to be, they're, they're talking about putting another 48 units, and that's, again, the same developer. So then we're, this is the JNC Adams site of New Street. Um, we've had now two hearings before the planning board, um, and they have uh, decided to have their deliberation, uh, we think, at the end of July, although that, that date may change. Uh, and if you've been paying attention, you'll, you'll know that the sidewalks have been a big bone of contention and a flashpoint for that because New Street um, was not really in the study area, it was just on the border and uh, it's being, the building is being positioned as transit oriented design but it's hard to make that case when it's not easy to get to the transit, which it isn't. Um, then if you go over into the quad, you find uh, the Atmark building where a two bedroom unit rents for $3,100 plus parking plus utilities and uh, to my knowledge there are no three bedroom units in that building. Um, its accessibility, because it's in the quad and cut off from the AOIFT uh, by the commuter rail tracks, its accessibility would be greatly improved if the proposed bike and pedestrian bridge across the tracks were built. Um, but that idea has been kicking around for well over a decade. There's now some money earmarked for a design, but it's um, several years away from completion if it happens. Um, then if you go across into what's called the triangle, you have Cambridge Park Drive, uh, where a real, what we call a tsunami of development has been going on. There are four new buildings and another, the largest one of all that I talked about a few minutes ago that's going to come before the planning board this summer. Um, we're looking at 1,552 units potentially on Cambridge Park Drive, which is, I just want to point out, a dead end street. That's the Pfizer building there at the very end. This is the LYFT. You come in off of Route 2, and that's Ringe Avenue over here. And then the Vox building um, is the former Faces nightclub, and that's just sort of up here. But it's sort of, although it's not technically in the triangle, it basically shares the same, um, same geography. And here is a picture, in fact, of the Vox building, which uh, replaced the nightclub, and its driveway is right on Route 2, as is the building. Um, then if you go back into Cambridge Park Drive, this one is 160, that will be almost 400 units. It, uh, they are already starting to lease, although it's not quite finished construction. This is uh, the proposal for the largest of all 180R Cambridge Park Drive, 378 units plus a nine story garage. This would be the fifth spaceship to land on Cambridge Park Drive. So just to recap, in the triangle alone, you have almost 1,800 units on a dead end street. And one of the things we've been wondering about is, is why these decisions seem to be made in a vacuum or in an isolation without um, very much regard to the cumulative impact. All of these uh, projects have to submit traffic impact studies where they try to estimate the number of daily vehicle trips they will add and the number of transit trips they will add. And I took the eight different proposals, the six that have been permitted and the two that are proposed and did the addition and this is what I came up with. Um, so I know that many of them are, you know, hoping that their tenants will be living car free lives, but the estimates are still very high and the transportation is a real challenge in that area as everyone knows. So um, this, this is one of the drawings from the planning study, uh, which showed, you know, back in 2000, four or five, how they thought things might develop. Um, also some new connections, uh, new roads in the quad, new, uh, perhaps this might be one of the places uh, where there might be a, a pedestrian or bike bridge. There wouldn't be more than one, and there is no uh, intention to build an actual road for cars or buses across the tracks. Um, this again is the, the railroad tracks. Um, so the, the Concord Alewife plan envisioned the addition of about 2.8 million square feet of development by 2024, that's 10 years from now. We've, we've calculated that we're already at 3.5 million with what's been permitted and what's being proposed, and that would be 10 years ahead of schedule. 
Um, and we would like to also note that 98% of that development has been housing, um, which is not a bad thing by any means, but it needs some things to go with it. So, very quickly, what's missing? Um, everything else that makes a neighborhood. Mixed use, some small retail, some public spaces that bring people together. So far, in our opinion, what we've gotten is parking for people. Um, also, what's missing, we think, is a better balance of housing. Um, again, the profusion of small luxury units in hotel-like buildings, one size, it's all, doesn't fit all of Cambridge. I have a third one here. <laughs> Um, another thing that's missing are the pedestrian and bike connections and the transit infrastructure of the dead end streets and the railroad tracks cut everybody off. And finally, uh, safeguards to protect these wonderful open space resources. Are we tempting fate? This area is prone to flooding um, and there are wetlands around. So finally, in conclusion, um, we feel that this area is, has become somewhat of the poster child for the problems of the piecemeal planning. Um, and a planning board that uh, candidly takes uh, quite a narrow view of its authority to shape how the existing planning study is implemented. And um, that's why we feel we need a master plan, we need some changes in the planning process, and we need more residents to get engaged and say that they care about how Cambridge's final frontier is developed. Thank you. Designs a building, you think where the elevator shafts go, how many elevator shafts you'll need, what kind of plumbing conduits, and so forth. What we've built here is buildings, they have their elevators, but the, the roads to support access to them, the kinds of uh, amenities that Jan was talking about, the answers that we've gotten is these will come later. And so I think it's the same sort of rationale that if you built a six story building, and you say the elevators will come later, <laughs> you get yourself into a big problem. So I don't think we're uh, against the buildings. I grew up in New York. Streets of apartment houses, fine by me. But the, the, the idea here of plopping down buildings without a plan for infrastructure and saying that will evolve just seems like weak plan. What about car key, the affordability? Yeah, obviously, I mean, I think we mentioned that there's all one type of unit being developed. Um, and yeah, there, there are inclusionary units with them, and I don't want to minimize that, certainly. Um, but it's not, you know, with this many units, it's not having a tremendous impact on affordability. And I think, you know, I'm not sure whether the supply-demand curve works the way people think it works in terms, you know, of what appears to be a fairly infinite demand from international investors and uh, other people so that even building more of this kind of housing isn't necessarily going to help cool prices generally in the rest of Cambridge. So we are definitely concerned about that. So the answer is there's nothing we can do about it. Um, I'm not sure. Any, uh, I, this isn't for answers. This is, yeah. this is just for, yeah. Um, We're out of time. For okay. Sorry. We're out of time for this segment, but there'll be affordable housing as a panel all in of itself. Thank, Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Jan. First, uh, um, I, I wrote in my uh, original notes, which I did not end up saying, that when a butterfly flaps its wings in East Cambridge, you get a traffic jam. In, in West Cambridge, and I think what we're what we're trying to introduce us all to is that we are a little over six square miles, and everything that happens in one part of our community has a cumulative effect on the rest of us. But Fresh Pond and West Cambridge have really gotten more than their share of an impact, and it, it, it shows. I really want to acknowledge and thank um, 
former everything Alice Wolf, state representative, city councilor, mayor, and school committee woman. Thank you, Alice, for coming. And I want to thank Dennis Benson, city council member, vice mayor, for being here. And Benka Ben Musicom, our former city council member. Welcome and thank you. So, East Cambridge, the courthouse team is up. Thank you. Just uh, because other people have come in. You have a bright kind of pink-orange um, card. That's your registration card. Please fill that out and throw it either into the center of your table or into a box or a basket if there's one on your table. Should be pens there. Um, and you have a poll. You can either fill it out now and throw it into the middle of the table or perhaps wait until some of these presentations to see what you're thinking as at the end of them. And then with that's an informal anonymous poll, we'd like to, you to leave that on the table as well so we can see what you're thinking. Thank you. Mark Jacob. Hi, folks. Um, I am actually not going to talk about the courthouse. I'm going to talk uh, uh, for you with a, a little history. Uh, I am from what city officials call neighborhood one. Uh, let's orient ourselves. East is that way. Um, Cambridge, East Cambridge is bounded by the Grand Junction Railroad tracks, the borders with Somerville, Boston, the Charles River, and Broadway. Um, you may be familiar with the area known as Cambridge Research Park, east of Third Street and north of the Broad Canal, where the Genzyme building is. When Lyme Properties developed this site, Residents objected to the lack of mitigation and sound urban planning. A lawsuit ensued. Uh, a group of Cambridge residents took ownership of the planning process and won. Make no mistake, it was expensive and unpleasant, although I believe the costs were awarded to the victors. Um, if you go there today, you can enjoy the results for yourself. Not only did we get a Riverside boardwalk, a skating rink, public plaza, fountain, and some good retail and housing, um, we also got money for open space, and affordable housing. Um, and the neighborhood got respect. Um, when Alexandria Real Estate assembled 13 acres and came to the city with a zoning amendment to allow commercial development to use the density bonuses put in place to encourage housing, they came with a really nice basket of goodies and asked if that was an acceptable place to start the conversation. It was, but it was just a start. The East Cambridge planning team uh, appointed me to chair a committee to represent the res residents in further negotiations. And while this, again, was not a very pleasant experience, we were able to insert a load of good urban planning and close to 300 housing units uh, in the project. Um, this was quite an education. It led me to look at development all across the city as well as my own little neighborhood. I realized that between Alexandria Cambridge Research Park and North Point, we were wedged in between about 80 acres of new development, and the city was leaving most of the urban planning to the residents. This should not be our job. Our job should be to maintain eternal vigilance and ensure that our government works for us. Um, the message that I'd fo like folks to take away from all this is that you can make a difference. Um, it's time to call on the city to give us a real master plan, which can take into account cumulative citywide and regional effects of development. I would also like you to know that you can make a difference. The key is to stick with it over the years. Take the long view, do your homework, be prepared, take them to court if you have to. It doesn't come quick, and easy, quick or easy, but you can make Cambridge a better place. Thanks. My name is Beth Stevens. I live over in East Cambridge on 100 Spring Street. I've lived there for about 20 years now. Um, I'm relatively new to the activism and what's going on in the development. Like Jan had mentioned before, um, you know, you start seeing these things popping up. As Mark said, we've had a significant amount of development in, in East Cambridge. Um, but really what caught my attention is what's been going on with the Sullivan Courthouse. The 40 Thorndike Street parcel that I think almost everybody can see in Cambridge. It's the huge building that has the orange stripe around the top. That building is 300 feet in, a, in an area that's zoned for 80 feet. At the time that it was built, it was built more than two times the size allowable for zoning, but it was possible because of sovereign immunity. It was built by uh, the government, and so they didn't need to um, respect the zoning laws or comply with the zoning laws. As a result, in 2008, um, the courthouse has now moved out of that building. And since 2008, we've only had about 200 to 400 prisoners um, that have been housed in the top two floors of that building, and otherwise it's been empty. Recently, the state has decided that it's no longer going to use the building and is selling it to a developer, and they've sold it at a price um, 
encouraging the developer to rebuild to the full bulk and, bulk and height of that building, the full 300 feet, 510,000 square feet, um, despite the parcel really only being um, zonable for about 220, 230,000 square feet. The neighborhood has drawn together out of the concerns of the impacts that it's going to have because in addition to um, the uh, change into the commercial use, the expected um, increased usage intensity before it was a courthouse operating from Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 4.30 and now we're looking at a commercial establishment that's going to be open nights and weekends and looking to draw uh, many more people and many more car trips and transit trips than previously. Um, our neighborhood has um, rallied around together. Um, we've gotten a tremendous amount of support, reaching out across the city as well, because we do believe it's an interest to the entire city, um, as you know, the impacts on the infrastructure is going to go citywide. Um, and we've actually made some progress. We've um, had the city council has passed a resolution asking for the state and the developer to work together to substantially reduce the height and traffic and impacts that this development is going to have. Unfortunately, we've been stuck because the state hasn't come to the table on that. The developers come back and they've agreed to take off two floors, which is about 40,000 sque 40, square feet from the 510,000 square feet height. Um, but the neighborhood is concerned that that is still not enough of an impact and we're continuing to rally around and to urge the planning board that we believe does have the power to say no to this special permit that's currently pending before them so that the city can send the message to the state that the, um, whatever ends up happening there has to be in more into conformity with the neighborhood. So I just ask in your packets, we um, put some flyers that um, represent what we're looking for. As you can see, this is what they're currently redeveloping to. What we're asking for is a substantial reduction in that height, and even with a substantial reduction, we still have a really big building in the middle of our 35 to 45 foot um, height uh, residences. We also have a letter in there, a form letter, that if you agree with our position that, um, lead, that spells out some of the impacts we're concerned with, if you want to go ahead and sign that and send that in to the planning board to let them know, the planning board meeting is July 8th, and I can also take them here um, if you want to give them to me as well. So I'd be happy to answer any questions later, and uh, I'll turn it over to Seth, who's been working with me on this as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, folks. My name is Seth Teller. I live on Hurley Street. I've been there 20 years as well. For the past couple of years, as, for the for the past couple of years, we've engaged with the state, with the developers, with the city, to try to understand and make better this proposal to redo this the Sullivan Courthouse and. And I have to say, the more we've learned about the process, the more deeply disappointed we've been with our city agencies. The, the CDD, the Traffic and Parking Department, the Planning Board, they seem to be asleep at the switch. They don't seem to ask tough questions. They don't seem to analyze the data that they, they're being given by the developers. I want to give credit, though, to the City Council, who has stepped up to support a, a, a saner development of this site. But one thing we've learned there is they don't have that much power. The power here seems to rest mostly with the planning board. And again, they don't seem to be applying the, thoughtfully the criteria they're supposed to apply. I'll just very briefly talk about our concerns. And I want to say in response to that question that was asked a few minutes ago, we're not NIMBYs. We're not saying, you know, turn the thing into a park. We're saying we want a reasonable development there, not a 22-story glass spaceship parked next to a bunch of houses that are two stories tall with, with thousands of people next to right across the street from, from small houses. So there's an intensity issue, there's a traffic issue. When we brought the traffic issue up, the city basically said, well, it's already graded F. It can't get any worse. <laughs> but that's, of course it can get worse. Uh, there's a garage parking issue. A development of that size and scale needs several hundred parking spots guaranteed. The city certified that those spots were available in the municipal garage. We went and got the data, did the analysis, and there's no way. The garage is already headed for saturation even without that development. When we called that to the attention of the city, there was no public correction, not even acknowledgement. So the short story is here. Everywhere we've looked, we looked at parking, we looked at uh, surface parking, we looked at wind, noise, light, time pollution, uh, light pollution at, at night. Uh, we looked at privacy. The city either uh, doesn't ask any questions about these issues or doesn't even acknowledge that they exist. It's just deeply disappointing for us as citizens. And just to echo what Mark said, this is really not our job to dig into all this data. I mean, we've been doing it for two years, but we shouldn't have to do it. The city should do it and we should hold them to it. So I think the, the, the story is thanks. We've uncovered a dysfunction in the city process. We don't know how to fix it, but I do think it's systemic. A good first step is for us to raise our voices as we're doing and demand that these agencies do their jobs more thoughtfully. The master planning initiative is a great outcome in general, but we also have to keep the pressure on on the specific fronts that we've heard about, several before ours, but certainly in our case, it's the S S Sullivan Courthouse. So we do ask everyone here to act in solidarity with us, contribute a signed letter to Beth in the red dress while you're here, 
uh, give her or me your email address as well, and we can keep you on the list for, for future announcements. Thanks very much. We have a few minutes for questions, please. Yes. Carolyn. Hi, Carolyn. Uh, I just, I'm sorry. Is it on? Is it flipping on? Oh, just wanted to bring up the concern about a glass sheath building and refer you to the Nasher Art Museum in Texas, that's N-A-S-H-E-R, that is glass sheath. There's a building next door that's glass sheath. Raise the temperature in the park by the museum of the soil, raise the temperature of the soil from up to 115, 125 degrees. Plant life dies at a temperature of 105 degrees in soil. They, in the museum, they had to move their artwork away from the windows, uh, and, and it's a sculpture museum. They had to move everything away from the windows that face that tall glass sheath building. So uh, I question what the courthouse, being glass sheath, will do to the nearby neighborhood and how the reflection of the sunlight will affect the temperature of the houses net across the street or the buildings across the street. So I just keep that in mind. It's a great point. The current building is, is made out of uh, not too reflective concrete with very small windows and the new plan would be for something that's pretty much all glass. The developers did hear us push back very hard on that and have modified their plans by reducing the reflectivity and the amount of glass. Like to some extent, I don't think it goes far enough, but they have responded. Yes. Hi. Just on that point, uh, the city's light task force is uh, apparently backing away from any kind of uh, regulation of light pollution from indoor sources so that whatever the developer proposals for the glass office building, if it's inadequate uh, to prevent light pollution and interrupted sleep and other problems, uh, public health problems associated with that, the city is uh, so far not going to touch that. Thanks. The previous comment was about daytime light effects, and, and Marilyn's comment was about at night when you've got busy bees in that uh, 22-story tower with all their computers and their lights blazing all night. You're, we've calculated that it's like having 100 full moons outside your window every night until those folks uh, go home and go to sleep, which they may never do because they're all in their 20s. Yes? Uh, Jane, I think we're done. We're, Are we done? Yeah, we're done. Okay. Thanks um, very much, everybody. Our, our thank you. Thank you. East Cambridge and uh, particularly the courthouse team. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. 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 There are cards on your table, so if your question or comment doesn't get done orally, please write it down and put it into the basket or into the center of your table because we really want to hear what you're thinking. So now, our last panel for this first session of where have we been, where are we now, is the Central Square and Area 4 panel. Um, so Jackie King and team. Hi, my name is Jackie King. I live in Central Square on Essex Street. Um, Shall I introduce everybody, I guess? Um, after me comes Paul Stone, uh, and then Charlotte Seed, and then Richard Krushnick. Um, I've been charged with just giving a little background and history on Central Square development issues. Historically, Central Square has been a blue-collar, mixed-income, racially diverse neighborhood, welcoming to immigrants and single-parent families. It grew up in relation to the light manufacturing plants in Area 4. The residential streets surrounding Central Square are dense and urban. They carry modest, low to mid-rise housing, schools, churches, shelters, halfway houses, small parks, and an incredibly diverse population. We who live in this neighborhood love these qualities about it. We believe it's possible and necessary to preserve the character of the square even as the city grows and develops. In recent years, however, the transformation of Kendall Square has begun to put tremendous pressure on Central Square and Area 4. Light manufacturing has been replaced by high-tech, biotech, and pharmaceutical companies. Giant real estate firms and corporations from all over the globe, as we know, have fixed their sights on Kendall Square. Huge office buildings and labs have sprung up. 
They loom over the old neighborhood, especially over the public housing developments at Newtown Court and Washington Elms. MIT's real estate arm has moved aggressively to build large commercial office buildings, but so far has not been willing to build new housing for the 5,400 graduate students and postdocs that currently live off campus. Charlotte will talk about that in a minute. All of this has lit a fire under the housing market in Cambridge. Housing prices have been driven sky high, and many of the longtime residents and families have been priced out of the city. While this process is touted by developers and many city officials as one of exciting opportunities, so far it has also been a process of displacement and gentrification. This fact was brought home to us in the spring of 2012 when city consultants put forward a map of Kendall Square that showed half of Newtown Court wiped out to be replaced by higher rise mixed use development. Residents were outraged. Led by the public housing tenants, the community mobilized and protested. Eventually, city planners withdrew that idea. Out of that battle, the Cambridge Residents Alliance, among others, was born. Next came an upzoning petition that allowed the Cleveland-based real estate developer, Forest City, to build a huge bio lab at 300 Mass Ave that exceeded the zoning limits. The community mobilized again, but, the, but this project went through. We were able to prevent Forest City from building a 14-story market-rate residential tower right next to the firehouse. Most important, we played a role, <clears throat> along with others, in securing a deal that saved 168 affordable housing units owned by Forest City and University Park. Then we began to hear about the massive upzoning that was being planned for Central Square as a whole. The city's consultants put forward plans to make Central Square into an upscale bedroom community for all the highly paid workers at the Kendall Square companies. We could see the luxury towers marching down Mass Ave and Main Street to Central Square. We were and are convinced that building high-rise luxury apartment towers does not ease the housing market and bring down prices. On the contrary, it has a ripple effect on surrounding neighborhoods, driving prices up and pushing more low and moderate income residents out of the city. At this point, we began to interact more consciously with the city appointed advisory committees that were charged with making these plans for Central and Kendall Squares. Paul Stone is gonna talk about that now. Uh, I've been asked to speak about the C2 Central Square Advisory Study, mm -hmm. whose appointed committee was supposed to represent the needs and best interests of our community in designing a future for Central Square. Uh, and I think I'll start off by talking about some of the fatal flaws uh, of the advisory study. The first flaw, to those of us observing C2 from the sidelines, the process led by our community development department appeared totally biased toward the massive upzoning of Central Square. That seemed to be a predetermined set of goals towards which they were directing the uh, efforts of the committee. Um, there was no representation of the neighborhood groups in the, uh, in the committee, and most of the members of the groups appeared to be selected for their pro-development uh, bias. Some of the committee members were actually property owners whose uh, property values would, would go up uh, or the recommendations of the committee followed through on. Experts were brought in to make slanted presentations supporting development. Traffic studies ignored problem intersections. The red line suddenly, against everyone's experience, was reported to have 40% additional capacity during rush hour. Uh, and nobody so much as whispered a peep about increased traffic counts. From the start, it was clear that the city-owned parking lots were targets for development. The second flaw, there was little focus on what many of us see as the key central square issues. The need for more affordable housing, the lack of additional rush hour capacity, but hey, we've already got 40% more than we need. Uh, the need for open space and traffic relief, the impacts of gentrification on families and lower income groups. The third floor, there was no consideration of projected citywide growth and its impacts on Central Square. The study was done and conducted as though uh, Central Square exists in a vacuum. Uh, there was no mention made of the fact that 20 years down the road, we were talking about 18 to 22 million square feet of additional development, almost half of which has already been built in the last three years. 
uh, 50,000 to 65,000 additional auto trips on city roads. Really? Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, um, C2 made three primary zoning recommendations. Um, they set, they set uh, the area into two districts, the Osborne Triangle and Central Square. The Osborne Triangle starts at Main Street and runs east towards uh, MIT. And they basically set up for zoning up to 16-story uh, height apartment towers in Central Square and 18 stories in the uh, Osborne Triangle. Uh, no mention was made of how, uh, how they might uh, create um, of increasing the inclusionary zoning law formula, which is what uh, the, little, the little affordable housing that's created now comes from. Uh, Cambridge Residence Alliance recommendations. Okay, continue to allow all development citywide under current zoning. Uh, develop an honest citywide master plan. Institute a temporary pause in all upzoning and special permitting for developments over 10,000 square feet. Use city-owned parking lots for open space and 100% affordable housing. <laughs> Increase inclusionary zoning formula from 15%, which it is now, to 25%. And lastly, which Nancy will be speaking about, reform the permitting process. Is that three minutes? Really? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And those issues of gentrification and development and responsible planning are especially relevant to Kendall Square. So that's a hot area these days, and MIT is really at the center of it. People come to Kendall because of the ideas coming from MIT, because of the innovations and the patents, and those ideas are driven by graduate students and postdoctoral researchers who make MIT the desirable place it is. However, MIT has not been providing enough housing for these people who need to work there and who drive this innovation. I'm a Cambridge resident who happens to also be an MIT graduate student, and I've been really active at MIT to try to study housing needs and to push MIT to house an increasing percentage of its researchers. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I wanted to bring to your attention that there are 4,000 students who are living off campus, and in addition to that are 1,400 postdoctoral researchers who are sort of this invisible population and in that they need houses just like students do, but they aren't counted in the same way. Um, of those, there are 2,500 students who live in Cambridge, so taking up apartments, um, sorry, uh, <laughs> because there aren't enough university beds. Um, not only are we increasing uh, pressure on the housing market, but groups of students can double up, pool their admittedly small incomes, and price out families which is something that we don't want to do, but is going to happen if MIT doesn't continue to provide housing. Uh, so MIT has a great opportunity in Kendall Square. It owns land, it has money, and it could do a lot to increase housing for its own people. Uh, so the committee I was on recommended 1,000 new beds. They recently, I guess grudgingly, accepted that this was a reasonable idea. I'm looking forward to seeing this implemented, but it's only a start. Things are gonna get worse with more development, and I think we need to keep the pressure up. Thank you. Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, uh, only about half of you have this hand up, but for those of you who do, pull out from the left-hand side of your packet this thing that says Bishop Allen on it and open it to the second page so that at least some of you can see this uh, idea. Uh, so this is the largest of the, uh, pub of the publicly owned parking lots on Bishop Allen uh, that the city is talking about uh, developing and not using as parking lots anymore. Uh, this is part of the uh, idea for building uh, housing in this part of the city uh, to house some of the workers that are moving into the Kendall Square businesses and so on. Uh, it's the position of the uh, Cambridge Residents Alliance that if anything's built on these parking lots, it should be all affordable housing, uh, not uh, a uh, luxury uh, housing that just has the 11.5% obligatory inclusionary affordable housing component, but all 
affordable housing. And it's also the Residence Alliance position that uh, the um, land should not be sold by the city. It should only be, uh, if it's, it, it should be leased on a long-term lease, but never sold. Uh, we're discussing what to do uh, with this, these parking lots that don't have a position yet. The Cambridge Resident Alliance is trying to develop a position. Uh, this was just done to help our initial conversation so we could have something to talk about. But just to give you an idea, if you look at this, uh, the uh, mural uh, is over here, the lovely mural that used to be on the side of the co-op. And, and this shows uh, a 28 foot wide open space, uh, a public space uh, with some market stalls that have removable walls that can open up onto the market space. This particular one has commercial on the first floor, but we are not agreed on that either yet. Uh, and the idea here was that, no mic momentarily, that uh, you'd have three stories up on Bishop Allen and then the fourth and fifth stories would be stepped back and you'd have three stories across from the mural and the fourth and fifth would be stepped back for more uh, light and air uh, and openness. Uh, and uh, this particular concept would provide 58 units of housing, uh, you know, like daycare, community space, uh, stores on the first floor. Uh, and uh, underneath the building you could fit 49 cars but you're displacing 81 cars on the parking lot. So it doesn't make any sense to go ahead with these conversations unless there's a simultaneous conversation going on about what are you going to do with all the parking that you're removing by developing these parking lots. And uh, we wanted to include this uh, introduction here just because uh, uh, the City Council has already put this on the table for discussion and there's going to be a hearing about it coming up in a couple of weeks and uh, so uh, I encourage you all to think about this so that we can have something to say uh, collectively when the time comes. Thank you, Richard. I think Richard's uh, piece of this conversation reflects, and, and, um, and Charlotte's as well, that we're really trying to be people for solutions. We're trying to figure out collectively what we need and how we can get it, how we can finance it. We need all the brains in this room to be part of that process, and we need to be doing it all over Cambridge. Central Square is just one piece of it. Do we have time for questions? Yes, we, we have a couple of um, minutes for questions or comments. Shelly will come. Shelly will come. What about the farmer's market? It's on. Can Yeah, if we take away the parking lot, where's the farmer's market going to be? Exactly. Uh, and so that's the whole problem, right? That's what we have to collectively discuss. What are the trade-offs, you know? If you want to leave more open space than this concept plan, which you would have to do to have a decent farmer's market, then you have less housing and so on. So that's, that's we have to come to some meeting of the minds on this. James, briefly. Thank you. In the light of the uh, interest in affordable housing on publicly owned parking lots, what about the little publicly owned parking lot next to where the Essex Street building was recently approved? And also, what about Vail Court? If there ever were a blighted property in Central Square, I think Vail Court on Bishop Allen Drive would certainly qualify. I think it's just, um, it's just fair to say that this is the reason we need a plan. Because it isn't about the Norfolk Street parking lot or the Essex Street parking lot. It's really about the big picture. And where do we do all of the things that we value and need in this community? So that's kind of why we're here. One more question and then um, we'll move to a break. Patrick, brief. Um, the low income housing component, are you, the way that the inclusionary ordinance works now, are you anticipating it working the same way with the 25% bump? Meaning that you increase the FAR of the overall build, the property, or no? Well, I'm just asking. On, on the public parking lots, 
No, because okay. our position is 100% affordable housing on the public parking lot. Well, I'm not talking just about that site. I'm talking about, you, you had a slide earlier that said a 15% bump yes. to 25% bump. Yes. Exactly. So it would function just as the inclusion ordinance works now, no? Except it would be right. much, much more affordable housing with a middle income housing component. Okay. 25% instead of 11.5%. So it would be a flat 25%? How do you, I'm doing, just the math is, I'm just, because right now you know how it works. You have, what? Right now so, it equals out to 11. Right, yeah, right now you, with the inclusionary zoning, you get 11.5% affordable housing, up to 80% of area median income affordable housing. We're talking about changing 11.5% to 25% and including a small portion of middle income housing, up to 120% of median income. It's not the question. But not right? for more building size, but not a bigger building. Yes, right. A building. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There's um there on the Cambridge residents. Wait, wait. I think we don't have time for questions. But if you want, if you're interested in the Cambridge Residents Alliance part of it, you can go on our website and our longer form uh, platform has a little more detail in it. Um, so right now, if you want to go to four o'clock. So right now. This is pretty amazing because everyone has been so respectful of time that we're a little bit ahead of our schedule. Um, it's, so we are going to take, um, I, I want to encourage again, um, if people would both uh, sign those letters and either leave them or give them to Beth around the East Cambridge Courthouse and fill out your registration forms, please. And so I'm getting there. Um, and we will be back at the tables in 10 minutes. There's some cold water and lemonade and some munchies. I hope people will stay for the second part so that we can move towards some action steps. So stretch your legs, but don't go very far. We have time for a couple of questions.